Matus. I'm a building inspector, certified, and a certified plans examiner. I do field inspections with the Department of Building Inspection. Today we're going to uh, thank you for attending our earthquake safety fair. And uh, today we're going to kind of run you through uh, how to obtain a permit. Okay. And the purpose of this is that um, we're going to hopefully leave you with a better understanding of how to navigate the building department and get a permit. All right. Um, kind of we're going to take a step-by-step -step approach here. And we also want you to know that uh, there are other regulating agencies. There's the planning department that reviews plans and permits, um, the Public Utilities Commission, Department of Public Works, and the fire department, if I didn't say that, uh, and in some cases, the Mayor's Office of Disability for city projects. So those agencies um, look at certain projects. Um, also, we want to relay how to understand the permit review options. Do you need plans? Uh, do you even need a permit? Maybe you don't need plans. Do you, can you get a permit over the counter or do you have to submit? Okay. And we also want you to be aware of the available resources. So benefits of getting a permit. Um, the purpose of the code is to protect the public, basically. Um, and the code is a set of regulations that provide for the minimum standards of habitability and fire life safety. So the code book has elements in it that um, keep buildings standing, um, exiting, uh, fire life safety, fire resistant construction, sprinkler systems, alarms. These are all regulations within the code. Um, as well as structural and seismic, uh, reinforcing uh, reinforced concrete, uh, steel, uh, shear walls and such. And those are all um, engineered elements that are basically recipes in the code book. Keep, the, keep your buildings uh, standing. Uh, we're also, the code also provides for uh, minimum standards for energy conservation, uh, heating, ventilating, air conditioning, these sorts of things. Um, all these together, they provide verification that the construction met, meets the minimum legal standards at the state and local level. Um, getting a permit provides you with a record uh, for your building, for the life of the building, that, that it conforms to the code at the time the work was done. All right? So work not requiring a permit. So the following uh, is a short list of work that does not require a permit. Uh, tool and storage sheds that are less than 100 square feet in projected roof area. So you can have a, a storage shed or a tool shed in your backyard uh, so long as the roof area does not exceed 100 square feet. So you, could ten, so you wouldn't build something 10 by 10 and have a roof overhang. You would exceed 100 square feet. Um, fences, uh, front fences, the front of the building, excluding a corner building. Um, the front fence, you don't need a permit uh, for a maximum of three foot high fence. And fences at the rear of the building, uh, in your backyard, uh, six feet high maximum. Retaining wall. So retaining wall is a wall that holds dirt behind it or some, something or some other um, material. The maximum you can build a retaining wall without a permit is four feet high from the bottom of the footing to the top of the retaining wall. And that is without a surcharge. Uh, we're going to hold questions till the end? Yeah. Uh, and so a surcharge basically means that the dirt behind the wall is level. It's not sloped. Okay. And moving on to more work not requiring a permit. Platforms and walks that are not part of an exit uh, that are equal to or less than 30 inches above the adjacent grade. So if you're on the first story of a building and you want to uh, maybe have dirt or something and you want a little walk or you want to make a, mi a small deck, uh, you do not need a permit for that so long as you keep it 30 inches below grade or equal to 30 inches. Um, painting and papering. So you don't need a permit to paint the interior or the exterior of your building. Um, I will say that uh, if the paint was installed prior to 1979, it's considered to have lead in it. 
So uh, before you sand or scrape, please contact a licensed painting contractor um, with that. So again, moving on to minor repairs to interior plaster and sheetrock. Um, you have a hole in your uh, wall and you want to patch it, yes, you can do that. You don't need a permit. The exception here is that the wall cannot be part of a rated assembly, a fire rated assembly. And a fire rated assembly is uh, a ceiling or wall that has uh, a time associated with it to resist the passage of flame. One hour wall assembly is typical for apartment buildings, uh, ceilings and floors in apartment buildings. So if you live in an apartment building, you most likely have rated walls and ceilings and property line walls too. <clears throat> Uh, floor coverings, not requiring removal of existing floor framing. So uh, that includes hardwood floor, linoleum, rugs, tile. Uh, the exception is commercial spaces. And for tile, the exception is a wet area. You do need a permit for like a tub surround or a shower stall because we look at the waterproofing. But other areas, you do not need a permit to replace the floor covering. And, and subfloor is considered part of the framing, which is the plywood underneath. Uh, glazing repair, that's glass only. You can replace broken windows. Don't need a permit for the glass only. And uh, work, more work uh, getting into electrical. Um, so it's electrical, you generally need permits for just about every electrical thing, with the exception of cover plates, which are the trim pieces around receptacles and switches, and surface mount residential fixtures. That being uh, something, basically, if you're not getting into the wall and it's just a surface, surface mount fixture, you do not need a permit to replace it. Fans, sconces, and the like. Uh, for plumbing, you're basically stuck with just changing your residential low flow toilet. Now, if you have any questions about uh, whether or not you need an electrical or plumbing permit, I advise you to come to the third floor of the building department and talk to one of the uh, electrical and plumbing inspectors there for more information. All right, so uh, alteration. So now here we are. Uh, you decided that you uh, do need a permit because you don't fit into the, any of the exempt categories. And the following is uh, for an over OTC, which sounds, stands for over-the-counter permit review. Um, that is, you come to the building department, you do not need plans, you just fill out an application and you can get a permit for the following work uh, without plans. That is dry rot repair, um, limited to 50% or less in kind. We usually see front stairs repairs and rear stair repairs and decks. Um, and we allow you to repair them exactly the same way so long as uh, you keep uh, below the 50% threshold. Re-roofing, uh, you can get an over-the-counter permit for that with the exception of a cool roof, which is a type of insulated roof. Um, window replacement, you can replace your windows, frames and all, as long as they're the same size and location. Garage door replacement, again, the same size and same location. Um, you do not need plans for non-structural kitchen and bathroom remodels. Now, um, the key here is non-structural. So we get a lot of kitchen and bathroom remodels. As long as you're not moving, removing walls, you do not need plans. Uh, it's when you start moving the walls around, you need plans. Uh, repair of stucco or siding. It's, it's pretty easy. You don't need to do don't need plans for that. Um, exterior siding replacement, uh, so that's more than a repair. Let's say you want to replace the siding. Um, you're going, the planning department will require pictures of that. So they want to see what you're doing to the exterior of your house. Generally, the planning department has entitlements for the exterior of the building. Um, so all, again, alterations with no plans. We have uh, installation of anchor bolts and plywood sheathing on the ground floor of residential buildings. So anchor bolts are what hold your walls down to your foundation. For those of you who didn't know, oh, excuse me. <laughs> Getting ahead of myself here. Um, exterior siding repair. And so installation of anchor bolts and plywood sheathing on the ground floor. Um, plywood sheathing is basically paneling that you put on a wall, okay? 
that's different than an, we're holding questions till the end too. So uh, the difference between plywood sheathing and a plywood shear wall, although they are both panels, uh, a plywood shear actually has an engineered, it's an engineered calculated element, okay? So that's why you don't need plans because this is simply putting in anchor bolts and sheathing to um, get extra bracing. We don't, uh, we don't calculate that out in our engineering plans. So um, a notice of violation, a notice of violations are um, generally people uh, who get caught working without a permit or they go over the scope of work, generally complaint based. Um, there'll be a corrective action on the notice of violation and it'll state with plans or without plans. All right. All right, so we've gone over what you, uh, over the counter permits. So let's say you decide you come to the billing department, you're gonna get your permit. Uh, you see this pink form up on the screen, that is our permit application. You fill one of those out for every permit, okay? Um, and it has basic information on the building, uh, the scope of work, the property owner profile, this sort of thing. Um, and with this permit application, you can get an over-the-counter permit, which is a Form 8. There's a little checkbox there for the 8. Um, you also use this form for submitted projects, which would be a Form 3. You would check the 3 box. And also for the site permit process, Site permit process is a little complicated. Um, generally speaking, it's uh, a conceptual and entitlement uh, permit that does not require a full set of plans initially. It's generally for large projects, new buildings, and a full set would be required at a, an addendum later on. And there's also the premium projects. Uh, as the name implies, it is, uh, you pay a little extra money and the permit gets reviewed quicker. So premium permit, premium price. Okay. And so those are the permit review options. Over the counter permit review. So we're gonna go over what you can do over the counter. So you can either do this with plans or without. So we have alterations with no plans. You can come to the fifth floor of the building department, have uh, some of the people review your permit application and ask you some questions. Um, alterations with plans, um, they can review that. They'll review that on the fifth floor and that is, will be reviewed by building and uh, some of our in-house engineers for the structural plan review, including disabled access uh, for commercial projects. And I just wanna clarify uh, that over-the-counter review is based on uh, being able to review your project in an hour or less, okay? So that's, that's how you can uh, get a counter, excuse me, get a permit over the counter. It's one hour or less um, per division. So you could do an hour through building, right? Through division. And uh, fire department, one hour. Planning, one hour. Okay, if it can be rude, that's, that's the general, um, how you get an over the counter. So, uh, and also when we're over the counter, permit review includes mechanical plan review and the fire department. Okay, so uh, with that, I'm going to pass this along to Inspector Ospital, who's going to go over um, alterations with plans. Good afternoon, thanks for coming. My name is Joe Ospital. I'm a building inspector with the San Francisco Department of Building Inspection. I work in plan review services. I am an ICC certified commercial building inspector plans examiner, accessibility inspector. Um, today, we've gone through uh, a bit of information and I'm gonna take over at this point uh, with the over-the-counter over review process. Um, when you start your over-the-counter review process, your first stop after, your, after the first floor in the, in the, um, at the information desk, where you will be provided a permit application and they will give you uh, some cursory information regarding your building, you'll go up to the fifth floor. On the fifth floor, you'll go through what's called initial plan review, okay? And at initial plan review, they're gonna screen, um, they're gonna screen your project and you're, they're gonna screen your plans. 
And again, this is for over-the-counter review with plans. They're going to look at your applicant information. They're going to look at your plans and make sure that all of the information that's required on the plans, building type, block and lot, uh, occupancy type, um, any design professional stamp or signature that may be required, um, scope of work, completeness of the submittal package, uh, looking at the index on the plans if one is provided that lists all the pages, make sure they're all there, and the general quality and re reproducibility of the drawings. Because once the drawings are approved and issued, we keep a copy, and then they're reproduced in a database, and uh, that's how we keep track of them. So review and approval of alteration projects with no plans. Um, IPR will look at the application, make sure that the application is complete, and, wa and send you to your different um, disciplines, being mechanical, plumbing, um, or a, fi a fire, you really don't get anything with no plans. And then routing to the necessary reviewing agencies. Some of the other agencies that would be involved in an alteration with plans is the planning department. So from the fifth floor, if it's, if it's required that you go to planning review, you're then going to go back to the first floor where the planning department desk is, and they will do their over-the-counter review of your drawings. Okay. Once you're done with the planning department, and I know it's a lot of up and down, you're going to come back up to the fifth floor. There you'll, the other disciplines that you'll most likely see are going to be your building and structural. And again, for building and structural, you'll get an hour for each discipline. Um, mechanical, energy, fire department, BSM, which is uh, Department of Public Works, Bureau of Streets and Mapping, and the PUC, which is the water department. And, you know, they want to make sure that you're, you have the capacity for the fixture count that you're providing on your plans. Once you've gone through all of your disciplines and everything's been stamped and approved and you're ready to go, um, then you're going to go to the fifth floor. Um, same area as IPR or initial plan review, but just to the other side. And that's where you're going to go through your payment of fees. And that's where um, your planning fees are going to be paid, your DBI fees, your field inspection fees, your transit development impact. San Francisco, San Francisco Unified School District. If the contractor is picking up the drawings, then they're going to make sure that he's a state licensed contractor in good standing, that he's got the workers' compensation certificate, that they've got their San Francisco business tax certificate, and if required, their Cal OSHA safety permit. At that point, once all that is met, you get your job card issued. Once your job card is issued, and let's go to the next page here. Once your job card is issued for OTC with plans, you can start your work, okay? Um, now, submitted projects. The intake process for submitted projects is a little bit different uh, because submitted projects are generally more complicated. They have to go through planning to receive their entitlements. Uh, it may, may or usually does require neighborhood notification or you're going through the site permit and addenda process, okay? So you would start at the central permitting, which is on the first floor. It's beyond the information desk. It's beyond the uh, planning department, all the way towards the back of the first floor along that back wall. You go up that little slope. Again, there they'll do essentially the same thing they do on the fifth floor, but at a larger scale. They'll go through an initial screening of the application, make sure all of the information on the application is correct. Once they've, gone that, once they've done that, they'll look at the plans, the scope of work, the building characteristics, the completeness of the submittal package, again, the quality of the submittal package. At this point, which is something different from over-the-counter review, at this point, you're going to have initial payment of plan review fees based on evaluation that you've provided to the building department. Once that's all been taken care of, it's going to be routed to the different departments, usually starting with planning, building, mechanical, fire, and so forth. And again, just to recap on the different um, departments involved, it's going to be planning, 
building and structural, mechanical, fire, bureau streets and mapping, and PUC. It's the exact same departments, just at a different scale, because the project is going to be a little bit more complicated to review. And as far as permit issuance from submitted projects, then you have your payment of fees. Um, you know, generally, um, you're going to pay your DBI field inspection fees. You're going to pay your public PUC fees, transit impact development, S uh, SFUSD, or your school fees if you're adding habitable, if you're adding uh, square footage. <coughs> Excuse me. And they'll look at the contractor requirements, the same thing, licensed in the state of California. Make sure you have your San Francisco business tax certificate, workers' comp insurance, Cal OSHA permit if required. At that point, we can issue a job card for a submitted, for a submitted project. Um, let's see, last, page, last couple of pages here. Additional separate permits that may be required. Uh, through the Department of Building Inspection, once you get your building permit, you could then get your electrical, plumbing, or mechanical permits. Ideally, that's the order you want to go in. Um, once, once you get your building permit, if you need a DPW permit for street space during construction, <coughs> or if the project you're doing is encroaching into the public way, you'd have to get a Department of Public Works encroachment permit. Other agencies is applicable. <coughs> Excuse me are uh, SFMTA, Police, Bay Area Air Quality Management District, OSHA, and et cetera. Um, lastly, we just want to make sure that uh, some of the best advice that we could give people who aren't in the trades or aren't in the everyday business of <coughs> getting permits, getting plans, doing construction, is prepare yourself. We've got a lot of resources at the SFDBI website. You can contact the planning department. On the first floor of the building department, we have the planning department there that's more than happy to answer questions. We've got an information desk for building at 1660 Mission that's manned uh, seven, seven hours a day that you can come in between, or actually six, between the hours of nine and three, or nine and, yeah, nine and four with an hour off for lunch. So that's six hours a day. Somebody's always at that desk that you can come in and ask code questions, ask different questions, and if we can't answer the question or we don't have the information there, we'll find you the information. <coughs> also, we have lots of printed materials at DBI that we make available to the public. All you gotta do is ask for it. Uh, you can go on the website, uh, www.sfdbi.org, um, right up there. And we've got a lot of administrative bulletins on the website. And what an administrative bulletin is, is if you're proposing <coughs> to do some work and you feel that the work you want to do meets the intent of the code but may not meet the letter of the code, um, there may be, and you can comply with the provisions in the administrative bulletin because it'll have its own separate set of provisions, then that, that may be an equivalency uh, in order to get your project moving or get it done. Um, also, you can visit the San Francisco, uh, the Permit Center at 1660 Mission Street uh, to answer any of those questions as well, and, and we'll walk you through the process. That's not, that's not something we're adverse to doing. We're public servants. You guys are the public. We're here to help you out. We don't want to turn you away. Last but not least, if the, one of the worst things you could do is get in over your head, because digging yourself out of a hole is always harder than digging yourself into the hole, okay? So uh, I would recommend that when you get into a larger project or you're really just not sure or you don't have the time, consult a design professional. You know, they're there to help as well. Um, and if you're dealing with a contractor, you're thinking about dealing with a contractor, the California, uh, the California State License Board in Sacramento has a great website. You just uh, type in their contractor's license numbers, and they can tell you the status of the contractor's license. They can tell you about any complaints, any actions, things like that. And that all goes towards you guys being prepared to take on a project. Because, you know, a project in your own home is not always an easy project, but it's worth it. Thank you, gentlemen. Uh, DBI is, first of all, customer friendly. We're here to serve the public. And the most important advice I can give besides what Joe said so eloquently is the over-the-counter process works. 
come in with your plans. If it's an over counter project, less than one hour per discipline. That's for the whole project. One hour for mechanical, one hour for electrical, one hour for structural. So that's really three hours. So we can get a lot of things done and we can get your plans over the counter. How quickly can we get you out the door? Uh, figure spend a day, day and a half, but in reality, we we permit over 90% of our projects over the counter. So it's not an onerous process. No, it's nothing new. Right, but it also, also the, des the design professional, very helpful. Absolutely. Very helpful. Okay, we're open for questions. Okay, your hand was up. First. Actually, no. That gentleman's hands was up first, and then you. We're going to have him come up to the mic? Here? Yeah, you got to come up to the mic. Okay, maybe form a line, if you like. First of all, I just want to say thank you for this. It's very helpful the entire day. Um, for retaining walls, it says equal to or less than four feet high. Uh, is that Does that include below grade? Yes. Yeah. Okay. From the bottom of the footing to the top of the wall, the full... Uh, the full net concrete you're pouring, yes. Gotcha. If I may, can you, under the initial permit review, you talked about uh, planning review. What exactly triggers planning review? Uh, yeah. uh, planning review is generally triggered by something that's going to be visible from the public way or a change of use or a change of occupancy. Um, oh. If you're going to change the envelope of your building, that's going to be triggered. That's going to trigger planning review. Um, any new construction triggers planning review. So uh, the best people to ask that question or to ask that question to and get a, the best answer you can possibly get would be the planning department. So the rule of thumb is visible from the public right, right away. Expansion, like additions or changing the envelope, as Joe said. Right. Yeah. And then finally, when is neighborhood notification triggered and what exactly triggers neighborhood notification? I would I would defer I would defer that to planning, but it's generally any of those things we just described. Yeah. So uh, visible from the the sidewalk. No, not necessarily no, not visible from the street. But changing the envelope. I think it's a 311 notice they call it, and that's neighborhood notification when you're changing the height of a building. Maybe you're infilling a light well, something that will affect the neighbor's view. Um, those sort of things. Definitely check with the planning department for that. All right. Thanks again. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thank you for your presentation. I really appreciate it. Uh, I have two quick questions. One is, is a demo permit needed? And if so, when is a demo permit needed? Demolition permit. That's, that's one question. In what context? Oh, a remodel, alteration, okay. addition. A, a demo permit is not needed. In fact, we would, um, we would counsel against it only because if a demo permit is issued and the demolition takes place on the inside of whatever structure you're doing, and then something happens and you don't have the funds to continue or anything like that, we now have a space that may be unsafe and unfit for habitability, and that's something we don't want to end up with. Nope. So generally when you're doing a remodel project, the demolition is all within the alteration project. Not a separate so, permit. Yeah, Not a separate me, permit. Uh, we do get these once in a while where uh, a person comes in and they they're getting, they're preparing, they have maybe plans that have been submitted and they want to get started on the project. So they come in and by demo, they want to demo all the interior walls of the building as opposed to demolish a building itself. So we do not allow demolition permits because as Joe said, you have an empty shell sitting there and uh, right. we don't allow that. Thank and, you. It, and actually the inside does have some sheer value. Right. Uh, the, and the, the more important question I have is, uh, I understand there's a position called permit expediter. There's a service that some people provide called permit expediting. What does a permit expediter do and how does a permit expediter uh, interface or interact with DBI? Um, well, I, I deal with permit expediters every day uh, or every day I'm on the counter. And basically a permit expediter is hired generally by either an architect or a homeowner or a project sponsor that doesn't have the time to go and interact with the building department on their own. So, you know, it's, it's a service that they provide people who don't want to come down and go through the process themselves. So, so the permit expediter does essentially what the project owner or the project owner's representative or design professional would do otherwise? Yes. Yeah. Generally, yeah, you pay a fee, 
give somebody a set of fully fully uh, a set of plans and they go down to the building department and get your permit. So you, you pay this person a fee for yes. professional services. Does this permit expediter have to be a licensed design professional? I believe they have to be registered. Right. They do not have to be a registered design as uh, a permit expediter. As a permit expediter, yes. Yeah. And they typically have a letter from the owner stating that they are allowed to pull a permit. Okay, thank you. So they are a service, mm -hmm. yeah. Yes, thank you for this uh, presentation. Um, as far as timelines, assuming that the uh, plans have been submitted and they're approved, how long, what, what, what is the time frame as far as when the uh, uh, construction has to take place and when does it have to be finished? Um, so to answer, you have two questions there. One is once it's approved, once it's approved mm -hmm. through all the, the disciplines, uh, then it's just a matter of paying for the permit and then you can start work. Mm -hmm. um, I. Uh, for projects that are, I believe, um, a million dollars of estimated uh, project costs or less, mm -hmm. you have 360 days to complete the project. Oh, that's when the permit expires. Uh, we offer one-time extensions, so getting near the end of that uh, expiration period, you would come in for an extension for another 360 days. Mm -hmm. Beyond that, you would need a senior building inspector to uh, ask, talk about your project and see where you are. If it's over a million dollars, I believe you have 720 days. Yes. And it's the same amount, same thing with the extensions. You would have to get permission after the second, for the second extension. <coughs> very good, thank you very much. You're welcome. Hi, uh, thank you uh, for this uh, workshop. Uh, if you have a, uh, a, uh, an illegal window that is uh, not fire rated, and uh, there were plans to put a, a to take, remove this window. Uh, is, is is that then? Uh, <coughs> if and then the window was not removed, so that there's a fire hazard there in the wall. Is is that uh, what happens after a couple of years when the plans that are uh, uh, submitted to you show that the window is uh, is not there? So just to kind of clarify what you're saying, you're <coughs> saying that uh, you ostensibly have a set of plans that are approved that show a property line window as existing? No, they, they, the, the plans show that it's not existing. This is a s oh, former situation. Okay. 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 It shows so, it's not existing mm -hmm. and on the plans. Yes. But when they actually did the work, they left the window there. Well, uh, as a field inspector, I would go out and, and look at the approved set of plans, and I would see that there was no window on the property line. And I would see that they had put one in. And at that point, <coughs> I would give them the option to go to the building department and revise their original permit. And we allow property line windows um, on the condition that they are fire rated uh, for 45 minutes, and they're non-operable. You have to fill out an administrative bulletin form and you have to get a notarized, uh, f uh, something notarized saying that if the building your next door is built up to that window, uh, then you have, to, you have to cover it up. You have to take out the window and put a real wall there. Um, so, so, so that being said, the, we, do we do allow that. So if they did that, they would, they'd, have to, they'd have a correction uh, or they would get a notice of violation. Generally, we don't just throw a notice of violation. We give people an opportunity to fix something that was is code deficient, and then if they don't, then we issue the notice of violation. So to answer your question, if it's not on the plans, they need to get a revised set of plans showing that they are installing a uh, window on the property line. Now, if the neighbors wanted to put a wall next to that, would that would they be able to? Would the neighbors be able to do that? If, if um, they would not be able to do that once the fire rated one is in there. Correct. What about before the fire rated one is Yes, in? so long as that opening is above the roof that's below at the time they're, in, they're putting the window in. So the window, if you have a building, uh, you can't just poke your wall out and put a window in so you're looking at the, the building. Okay, the fire rated window has to be above uh, at least, I think, I think they, six feet is what the code says, uh, laterally. Um, mm -hmm. And they, we allow them. 
but when they fill out that notarized form, they're also promising that if the neighbor builds up to that window or within that six feet, then they are required to close it off the window at that point. Oh, if the neighbor wants to build up, yes. they're required to close, they are required to yes, close off that correct. window. Yeah. Okay, thank you very much. Yeah, you're welcome. Okay, before anybody asks any other questions, I just want to remind everybody that this is a Q&A about getting permits. We're not going to answer any specific code questions. Uh, we have an information counter on the first floor of the building department that you can come down and get that done. And then we can give you the proper time that you're allowed. Okay? Uh, this really isn't the forum to ask specific code questions for any project or property that you might have. Thank you. Thank you for the wonderful um, presentation. I'm with the, um, the Department of, building, uh, of, um, Department of uh, Public Health and one of the senior inspector. And I send, generally send all of the applicants who come to the health department to BBI planning and, and other uh, fires department. Uh, one of the questions that mostly come up with is if um, an applicant uh, submit the application for a permit to operate at DPH for a massage or a tattoo establishment, but no construction is required or is needed, but facility was never a massage thank you was never a massage or a tattoo facility existed in that waken facility mm -hmm. or it's a, it's a salon but they wanted to add in an additional uh, kind of uh, uh, requirement for their uh, business and uh, thus the applicant need to submit plans to DBI or pull a DBI permit or do they require an over-counter permit only if they do not need to uh, do any construction? Because for record purposes, we have to get an approval yeah. from DBI to get mm -hmm. the permit. Yeah, I'll, yeah, I'll take this. Yeah. Um, generally, it's a change of use, so it would need to go through planning for approval. And in order to get, it would also, you would also need a building permit so that we can look at it to make sure um, you're complying with exiting, accessibility, um, fire life safety, any things that may be triggered by the change of use. Okay, one of the things that I, I came up with the problem with this is because every time I send the applicant to the DBI, they look at over the counter and they kick it back and say, if there's no construction, DBI right. does not generate any permit. Oh. So it, it's more of a planning, it's an entitlement to operate as, so it would be a change of use, first and foremost, right? Because okay. they are not a, um, they right, are right. not an establishment, tattoo establishment, or, so they're changing the use of the building. Okay. They do have to get, they have to formalize that with a permit, and a change of use um, does require a set of plans? It, it, it requires a set yeah. of plans. Specifically for a change of use. Right. right. And let me say, I'd like, I'll get your card afterwards yes, so we can do interdepartmental stuff. We can Perfect. maybe talk about it. Yeah. Wonderful. Okay. Wonderful. Thank right. you. <laughs> that was a good question. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I want to thank these gentlemen uh, for doing an outstanding job answering your questions. Once again, we're customer friendly. Come down. We have a desk that you can ask your question. Before you start your project, so you get an idea whether you need a design professional or not. If it's complicated, spend the money, you'll save money. <laughs> I want to thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.